वन टू नाइन थिंग टिल हाँ टुडे आई टेक इट लाइट आई नॉट टीच एनीथिंग न्यू डोंट वरी ओके सो इन द लास्ट फ्यू क्लासेस वी हैव बीन लुकिंग एट द टू स्टेज मिलर कॉम्पनसेटेड ओपन एंड वी हैव लुक डेट इन सम डिटेल सो लेट मी क्विकली रीड्रॉइट एट अ ब्लॉक लेवल So this is GM one. It's conductance capacitance. This is GM two. It's conductance capacitance, and of course, along with that, you will have the load conductance and load capacitance also. so what did we say we'll do for uh, eliminating the rhp zero here we'll put a resistor in series with this compensation capacitor and uh, if i want to cancel the zero completely what should the value of this resistor be so we try to choose rc to be 1 by gm2 so that will kind of get rid of the zero hmm? so can you summarize the uh, results here so what is the dc gain for this Yeah. Okay. Let GL me define GL prime to be uh, the parallel combination of GL and G2. Similarly, CL prime to be CL plus C2. So this is going to be GM2 by GL prime. Okay. What is my omega u? Or okay. I mean, let's uh, let's try the first pole location. What is the first pole location? Yeah. Let's ignore C1. Right. Let's get some approximate relations. gl prime so now what is omega u <coughs> i mean you should remember this result side right? you have quiz today huh gm1 by cc right i mean this is assuming the uh, feedback factor is unity right if we have some other feedback factor this gets multiplied by beta hmm? and in general i mean if i reduce this feedback factor uh, let's say uh, yeah so what do you think will happen to the phase margin Why? I mean, when I change the feedback factor, what all changes in the circuit? Gain, gain changes. Gain. Yeah, I mean, basically, a not beta loop gain changes, ah. and what else changes? Yeah, yeah I mean, uh, omega u changes, right? Ah. What, what? I mean, phase margin depends on what? Omega Ratio of omega u by p two. P two is not changing. Omega u is decreasing or increasing. Beta is less than one usually, right? Ah. I mean. If omega u decreases, what will happen to the phase margin? It will increase. If the second pole is far away from your omega u, it's good. Okay. I remember I uh, we also saw right beta equal to one is the worst case feedback factor you can have for Miller op amps where the phase is reducing monotonically. If I ensure that for beta equal to one it is stable, for all feedback factors less than one, it will be even more stable. Okay, so let's say now what is P two? Hmm? Second pole location. Yeah. GM two. Okay, first let's uh, give me uh, complete expression, then you can approximate quickly. Ah. Huh. GM two into CC by CC plus C one by CL dash plus. Remember the total cap was at this node was these two guys C two plus CL, and then you have these two guys in series, right? So this in parallel with series combination of these two caps, right? And again, here if I assume C1 to be much much smaller than C, uh, CC and CL, then what is P2 approximately? GM2 by CL. GL2 by CL prime. Okay. 
So we can, in practice, we always try to make this approximation that C1 is much, much smaller. When you say less huh. than, less than, what factor you can say, like minimum cost factor? See, that, that all now depends, right? See, uh, if say C1 is 5 times smaller than CC, P2 uh, will be, I mean, this expression will be uh, decent approximation. If it's much smaller, it will be more closer. It all now depends. Right? Yeah, yeah. Thumb rule is, I mean, let's say 5 or 10 times, you can definitely say. But now again, it depends, right? And uh, the act of adding this resistor here introduced the third pole. And uh, remember, what? where was this third pole approximately at? Yeah, 1 by RC times the actual thing was the, all the three capacitors in CC, sorry, in series. This is CL prime. And if I choose 1 by RC to be uh, GM2, so this becomes GM2. And among all these three, usually C1 will be the smallest capacitor. So that's what will dominate in series. So we'll have this. I'll just put it here itself. So, what is the phase margin here? 90 minus, 90 minus tan inverse of omega u by p2. That is, yeah, minus due to the third pole, okay, omega u by p3. This we called as some theta 3. And in practice, I mean, this pole will be at a much uh, higher frequency. So, uh, contribution from the third pole to your phase margin will be very small, usually. And in the last class, we also looked at uh, some design example, right. And the way we did was, uh, first we tried to design everything at a block level. And uh, the starting point was the following, right. So, the moment you are given the load capacitor and omega u, what was the first thing we calculated? I mean, we have three things to decide, GM2, CC and GM1. What was the first thing we calculated? GM2, right? The moment you are given CL and a phase margin, from omega you can find what is P2. Because phase margin decides how far your second pole must be from omega u. So once you know second pole and CL, you can find GM2. And that's usually the case because, see, uh, the, what was one of the reasons to go for a two-stage OTA? What, what to, drive load. to drive the load, okay. So it only makes sense that if you have a given load, that will fix your second stage first, okay. And usually that's what we'll do. So uh, the load, which is basically GL and CL, that will usually fix your second stage. Right? And in few classes before we saw, right, if let us say uh, after your design, if the uh, capacitance, load capacitance increases, what would you do to restore your circuit? No. I mean, again, the logic is the same, right? This is what is going to decide your second stage. Mm -hmm. So if your load becomes difficult to drive, you go and uh, make the second stage stronger. You go and increase GM2. Right? Because again, uh, the moment you increase CL, what will change is your P2 will drop, isn't it? So the way to counter this drop in P2 is to go and increase GM2. This is something we saw last class. And as I was uh, mentioning, uh, usually you start with some few degrees of phase margin extra because we have not considered some of the non-dominant poles. For example, uh, the pole at this node, which was basically uh, this guy. Okay, so we'll have some one or two degrees you know, added here and there. And actually, not just that, uh, there is one other place where you can have. And uh, remember, from each node to ground, there is going to be a parastic capacitor. Hmm? So here, is there some node from which I have been considered the parastic capacitor? Is there some particular node here? 
uh, from which I haven't included a parasitic capacitor. Sorry? Yeah, exactly, right? I mean, this node you have considered, this node I have considered, this is usually not so critical. There, there will be some parasitic cap at the input. Okay. So, in these cases, we haven't, uh, I mean, in the particular case, it is not of a concern because what we have is unity feedback, right. So, if you have to find the loop gain, you will, oops, what did I do? Oops, okay, fine. So, if you have a unity feedback like this, to find the loop gain, you will break the loop and you will apply some test voltage here, some input here. Now, the uh, input capacitor is going to come in parallel to this voltage source, so it will not play any role, right. But the moment you have a non-unity feedback, let me check to the next page. So, you will have a scenario like this. So, now you see this capacitor is going to come here and along with the resistors you have put, it will create an additional pole, okay. So, that will also actually come and uh, could degrade the potential your phase margin. So, okay, is there something uh, that you can do to fix it? I mean, assume that let us say you have designed the op amp, right. And as we saw the worst case phase margin is for unity feedback. You found out with unity feedback what the phase margin is, there this capacitor did not play a role. So, you got good phase margin. Now, I go and put it in a, a feedback factor less than 1. I usually expect that the phase margin should improve, but because of this say it is not improving a lot. So, instead of going and redesigning it, can I do something here? Okay, so uh, to think about it, what happens? At let's say this capacitor is not there. So uh, if I apply some, I mean, what will happen to the feedback? Let's say if this is V1 and this is V2. What is the ratio of V2 by V1? If the capacitor is not there, no. no. I mean, okay, uh, only the feedback network, right? Only this network. Okay. So uh, how? What is the feedback factor now? I mean, do you understand what feedback factor is? Okay, R1 by R1 plus R2. I mean, basically, the feedback network senses the output voltage and feeds back a fraction of it at the input, right? And that fraction is basically voltage division between R2 and R1. And what is that factor? R1 by R1 plus R2, right? And this is usually, I mean, okay, yeah, this, let's say at low frequencies is what we have. Now, at the moment you have this capacitor uh, CI, at high frequencies, this capacitor will introduce some phase shift, it will act like a short and it will destroy your feedback, right. So, basically if I were to sketch the uh, Bode plot of this feedback network alone, see this is R2. So, we have to sketch the frequency response of uh, this, how will it look? At DC, what will be the gain? Uh, whatever we saw, R1 by R1 plus R2 and then what will happen? We will have some pole, it will drop. So, by basically at high frequencies, the capacitor kind of uh, acts, I mean dominates and causes this roll off, right. Now, at low frequencies, we do not have a problem. Uh, simply because the uh, feedback division is happening between two resistors or two identical or two similar elements. Hmm? At high frequencies what happens? CI will dominate. So, the voltage division is happening between what all elements? No, no, yeah, CI parallel with R1 that is at high frequencies what is it? CI, right, at high frequencies this network is dominated completely by CI, okay. And here it is R2. So, at high frequencies the problem is arising because I have the voltage division happening between a resistor and a capacitor two different elements with different phases. Is that fine? 
at low frequencies we don't have the problem because there we have the division between two similar elements with the same phase now uh, with that information can you suggest something that will uh, that can be do that we can do so that at high frequencies the voltage division is happening between two similar elements <coughs> put parallel capacitors you can put a capacitor here okay is that logic fine so now at high frequencies what happens uh, what will dominate in this network cf, CF will dominate here CI will dominate. So, the division will be happening between CF and CI and both will have the same phase. Okay. And uh, at high frequencies, what will be the feedback factor then? CF by CI is Okay. So, now uh, the in frequency response, if you think, what happens at uh, earlier when we did not have the CF, we only had a pole. Now what I have done, I have introduced another path for the input to flow through CF. It is introducing a 0. Okay. So you will find that now you will have a 0 also somewhere let us say here. We will do this or you can go up also, I mean depends on the ratios. Right? And I mean uh, one nice thing is see now let us say R2 some alpha times R1. Now if I choose my CF to be CI by alpha, so these two ratios will be equal. Okay. I mean basically now this is like an impedance. This entire thing is now like an impedance sum z. In the feedback you will have alpha times z. Okay. So these two ratios will be equal. If I choose uh, my CF to be C i by alpha. Is that okay? In terms of pole zero plot, what you can what can you say about the zero location then? At low frequencies the gain is R2 by R1 plus R2. At high frequencies, what is the value now? Same. Same. So what can you say about the zero location? Same position. It is sitting right on top of the pole and cancelling it. So, we will have this kind of a flat response. I mean in practice of course, you cannot exactly ensure it, but even the point is you put a capacitor here that will kind of not destroy your uh, response, it will kind of restore it to some extent. And basically if you, the other way to think is at high frequencies usually because of this capacitor or I can say here, because of this capacitor, we have lot of delay. The capacitor acts like a short, the circuit will take lot of time to respond. Now the moment you put a parallel capacitor here, at high frequencies you have a conduction through this capacitor, right. Basically only uh, CF and CI are acting at high frequencies. So this kind of provides a fast path. For the okay. sorry, is that okay? I mean, solve the same thing. You add a zero so that at high frequencies you have a quick, uh, quick and dirty response from this path. That's all. So this is one thing you can do if you find that you know this input capacitor is problematic. Instead of going and you know redesigning the op-amp passage. Cool. Uh, so now we also. So let me, uh, today also we we'll look at uh, one other way in which you can design. So again, I'll assume the same thing. Uh, CL and omega u are given. So again, to start off, what can you uh, do? What could be a starting point again? Can you write the data? <laughs> Okay, you try, try, try to remember, right? I mean, now you should be in a position to think. I mean, you are given CL and omega u, what would be a starting point again? Phase margin is the thing you should assume. So, you assume phase margin. Okay. 
from yeah from face margin and omega u you can find p2 same thing the moment you are given a load you first go and design your second stage that should be a logical progression although that need not always be the case but this is a logical thing to do now i know p2 what what can i find next p2 is remember p2 is approximately gm2 by cl it's cl prime and which is approximately cl i mean it's okay so now uh, p2 and uh, cl that gives me gm2 hmm? so this is this is till this point it's the same so in the uh, last class when we looked the next step was uh, we had omega u and we kind of assumed cc and found gm1 so instead what we can also do is the following i'll assume the value for c1 okay and uh, how should my c1 be chosen usually less than cl it should be less than cl and cc so what can i choose it to be cl it should be yeah less than cl, CL. I mean, not hundred. That's too much. So let's say, say I don't know, uh, CL by five or CL by ten, something. I'll give that fraction to you. Let's say five or ten, whatever you choose. Better than CC when you leave from the nine. That we'll see, right? I mean, uh, as of now, <laughs> this is the deal. Then we'll see what happens. Hmm? So this is done, and now uh, what is C one? If I look, show the transistor level schematic, maybe that's apparent. So what is C one in our transistor level schematic? C one is the load capacitor, total capacitance at this node. What is that dominated by? Is that okay? I mean, again the same thing, right? You look at all the all the transistors that can contribute to the capacitors. We have M four. From M four, what will be the capacitor? It's connected to the drain. So obviously, from drain to bulb will be the capacitor. Same with M two, and for M five it will be the gate, right? So it will be dominated by the gate to source capacitance of M five. Okay. So now I know C G S five, hmm? and remember G M two is G M of transistor M five. Now uh, what is C G S five? Do you remember the expression for gate source capacitor? I mean, not exact. What? To, huh? No, it's not the overlap capacitor. It's just the oxide capacitor. I mean, okay. See, at least logically, if I increase the size of a transistor, do you think the uh, gate gate source capacitance will increase or decrease? Huh? decrease increase so it should be proportional to area okay that much is fine i'll not write yeah that's it yeah yeah so this is proportional to the area logically and there should be some capacitance that fixes see this one and that's the oxide capacitance here it is 2 by 3 third yeah it's 2 third do you know why 2 third comes because in saturation with this okay fine leave it we'll find it but anyways this is the deal so uh, now i mean uh, For my second, for the transistor M5, I can assume the length. So how can I choose the length? What might be the criteria? <coughs> this I studied also. Yeah, I mean you can. Uh, one thing is at the lower end, it will be limited by the minimum length possible in your technology. And if that minimum length is not giving you sufficient gain, you try to increase it. So you uh, choose it based on uh, your gain. That is R not. R not is length. Yeah. Okay. Okay. What is the expression for R not? Remember? Lambda is inversely proportional to L. Okay. So this will be proportional to L. I mean, this is something basic in the sense. If you want to have a larger output resistance, you actually use longer transistors. Okay. Okay. So now I have uh, L five. I know what is my CGS. What else can I find now? From this, what can I find? I mean, uh, in this equation, what all things I know? 
yeah i know i mean first of all i know what is cgs i know l c ox is a constant that you should know so you can go and find w okay so once you find w so basically you can find w and once you find w we have the value for gm we can now find everything the current overdrive voltage everything okay you can find the current through the transistor m5 the overdrive voltage of m5 and everything again i mean we'll see later how uh, instead of using these equations how you can systematically get the values later because in practice you don't depend on these equations to calculate for designing so we'll see later how we will do that but for now at least it should be clear that the moment you have this info you can actually find this is that okay so now i know the overdrive voltage so which means the uh, gate to source voltage for so where is it gate to source voltage for the transistor m5 is fixed so what voltage will be fixed then if the gate to source voltage for the transistor is fixed which of the voltages here is known i mean th this voltage is known so yeah that's okay but i mean my point is now let's say you know this voltage uh, can i mean can this be very low can this voltage go very low what will happen if it goes very low which transistor m4 m2 not m4 for m4 okay for m2 the n mos transistor the drain cannot go very low so i mean once you find this overdrive you make sure this is not really low okay we you know the gate voltage of m2 right what will be the gate voltage pcm roughly at vdd by 2 so whatever value you get for this make sure that it is not really low that it can go out of saturation so once you do you kind of check check for m1 and m2 uh, in saturation right okay so now once this is set i know the current density for the transistor m5 so what else you can do all the pmos will have the same current density so this will be same as current density for 3 and 4 right so uh, now oops sorry now what else i can do what else i can do next I mean, okay. We have what all we have found now. We have designed the second stage completely, almost, yeah. right? Mm -hmm. The second stage, this transistor, we know everything about it. So, do we have we known anything about CC yet? No. No. But we can now choose it, right? We know how should CC be chosen? Yes. Greater than C one. Okay. My CC should be greater than C one. I know what is my C one. Okay. let c1 is basically my cgs5 so i can go and choose some uh, you know cc that's good enough so once uh, cc is chosen what else i can find omega u is given right okay omega u is gm1 by cc so from omega u and cc you can find gm1 and gm1 is basically uh, the gm of transistors 1 and 2 in your schematic so now for the first stage you know the uh, gm hmm? now we have to find the currents and uh, the sizes so what can you do we go here ah oh, sorry no 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 uh, what, what what's your suggestion Oops, there is a schematic, man. Mm -hmm. Ah, I mean the question is now I know the GM for these transistors. That's all. Now I have to find the current and their uh, sizes. What will I do to proceed? So what is GM? 
expression for gm root of 2i mu c ox w by l what is the other expression into vgs minus vth i'll just call it to be over right hmm? so you, you just know gm hmm? you need to find all three so what can you do you have to assume something and proceed there is no other way and i mean one what do you think might be a reasonable uh, thing to assume hmm w by l i mean okay don't overdrive is a reasonable thing to assume why is that so uh, i mean okay not just that see here oops, let me see or i will draw it here right it's better this is your first stage so uh, his suggestion is let us go and choose the overdrive voltage which is the gate to source voltage do, do i know anything about the gate voltage I know it's roughly at PCM, say VDD by two. So fixing the gate to source voltage is going to fix this guy. Okay. So I know that this guy will need some at least 200, 300 millivolt of drain to source voltage to operate. So based on uh, this voltage, I can fix the gate to source voltage. Okay. So I can choose overdrive based on uh, VDS of. Detail current source. I'll just say it's V overdrive one. Hmm? I'll make everything this one. That's all. So once the overdrive voltage is known, I can find the current through the transistor M one. So I'll say from G M and the overdrive, I can find the current. And the W by L, right? Again, now uh, to find, I mean, I know the ratio W by L, so I'll have to assume the length and find the width. Again, length you decide based on the gain you can get. If you find the gain is not enough, you can probably go and try to increase the length, or you stick to the minimum length that is possible. Okay. And uh, lastly, I mean, yeah. So uh, we have the transistors M3, M4. what will be the current flowing through the transistors m3 m4 and i not by to i mean in, uh, it, have i found the current here what is the current in terms of what i have written here current density we found it. We, yeah for 3 and 4 you found the current density but we haven't found the sizes yet mm -hmm. i need to know the current to find the width Isn't it? Yes. So, what is the current flowing through the transistors three and four? I don't know. I don't know. It's I one, right? The current flowing through the transistor M one. Remember, M three is here. This is M one. This guy is M three. Oops. This is M one. This is M three. So, whatever current flows here is what is going to flow through M three. So I know the trans uh, current I three same as I one, so this will give me the width. So how will I choose the length of the transistor I M three? Huh? No, but uh, uh, to avoid systematic offset, how should I choose them? Same as. Yeah, it should be same as M5. Remember, to avoid systematic offset, the main thing was I should have the uh, ratio of uh, I by W by L should be same. So I have already chosen what is the length for the transistor M5. So I should actually uh, make it same as. Is that okay? Again, this is one way in which you can uh, go and do the design. Again, this is not the only way. Again, you can start with anything. And okay, so let's say now I uh, do it. Uh, I have omega u to be G M one by C C. 
So let's say I want to uh, reduce G, uh, CC. So to keep the same omega u, what should I do? I should also reduce GM1. And uh, how will I reduce GM1 to without operate without disturbing the operating point voltages? You have to decrease both current and width. So uh, can I keep on decreasing CC? What will be the limit? C1 will decide it. At the lower end, we assume CC to be greater than C1. So you can't keep decreasing CC. So this will be limited by C1 here. And actually in the other end, uh, I mean, oops. this will be C1. And you can't also decrease GM1 because as we'll see, this will be uh, fixed by the noise. So one of these will finally limit to what is the uh, lowest you can go. And also when you decrease GM2, sorry GM1, what, what other thing will change? Gain, ah, gain is changing, right? So I should also ensure that DC gain doesn't change. So now, uh, let's say I reduce the uh, GM by uh, doing this, reducing current and width. And let's say for example, I say uh, current is reduced by 2x and width is also reduced by 2x. What will happen to GM? It will remain same. Reduce by which factor? What factor? I mean, if, if the current is given, what, what is the expression for GM will use? 2i, okay. I mean, this is the reason why for reducing uh, GM, we reduce both of them by factor of 2. So GM reduces by factor of 2. What can you say about R0? Hmm? R0 is what? Increase by 1 by lambda id, so that will also increase by 2x. So what can you say about the gain? Gm or not? Same. So again the same thing, if you decrease all your gms in this fashion, by scaling both current and width, nothing else will change in the circuit. Your operating point, your gain, everything will be same. Why will phase margin change? For what does phase margin depend on? No, 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 that when we had the zero, let's say zero is not there now. Okay, omega u, it depends on omega u, but I fixed omega u, so it's okay. Yeah, he, he was saying that when we had the right of plane zero, you also had the term gm1 by gm2, but now we know how to cancel this guy, so let's not worry about it. Okay. Omega u will? Yeah, but we are uh, reducing both cc and gm1. The discussion was to keep the same omega u, what is the lowest I can go for gm1 and lowest I can go for cc. cc will be limited by c1 and gm1 we will see later will be uh, limited by noise. So, and if you want to reduce gm1 you do it like this, reduce both current and the width. Okay. 